Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. My guest today is running for the town council of Danville. He is a resident of over 40 years, has raised his family, his children here, has contributed to the community for as long as he's been here, and he was wonderful to talk to. It was wonderful to hear about why he wants to do these things and why he wants to give back. And it was just a very impressive and awesome conversation. There is a little blip at the end where his audio cuts out, but we get past it. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Dave Fong. Thank you for coming, sir. Hey, Matt, thank you for inviting me. You are welcome. It's a bit unfortunate that we have slid backwards with the air quality. I mean, it was supposed to be a beautiful Friday. I would, it I'd is like a beautiful to say, Friday. It ah. is a beautiful Friday. We just need to ignore some of the distractions. That's all. We just have to stay inside and be happy that yeah. it's Friday. But you know what? The opportunity is that it will get better, as it always does, and uh, it's okay. It's right. okay. I was actually talking to my wife about this. We we had a very rough um, rough week about a month ago. Uh, we were both very very frustrated with. Uh, with the state of everything, and then throwing on top of it to have these wildfires that were coming through and not necessarily threatening this specific area, but just we couldn't go outside. I have three little boys, and we're all trapped inside, and the kids are climbing all over each other. And we started looking at moving to Boise. Right? Like I, got, I, got, I know. We got really excited about the prospect of moving to Boise and having, a, having an awesome house or something, but it, it, we came back to that. It's going to pass. Mm-hmm. You know, like the the fires are going to come through. We're going to get better as a state, hopefully, of dealing with them. And if we have a couple weeks a year that, that where things get nasty, then that happens. You know, but we get through it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think I have a few more years on you. And so what you just said is absolutely correct because I've been through the ups and downs over many decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, been through something similar to what we are dealing with today. Uh, whether it's called H1N1 or whether we call it economic recession. Yeah, right. Uh, But at the end of the day, we're survivors. Right. But we're more than survivors. We come out of these different challenges smarter, uh, better, and I believe that we continue to build on what we've learned to be even stronger as we look forward for not only us but for our generations thereafter as well. Right. You know, I never understood that concept, the generations after. I mean, like – I understood it at the base answer, which is, hey, you know, what about your grandkids? But when you say that to a 17-year-old, they're like, whatever. Now that I have, I have my three boys and, and, you know, like I have my town and I have my house and I have my wife, my concern for the future of, of young people and, and having all of my students that I, that I worry about all the time, that concept of future generations, it's a, it's almost like I could only conceptualize myself initially, and now I can only conceptualize them. I don't, when I think about the future, I don't think of myself. I think of my kids and their kids. I'm not even part of the picture. It's just like, let's assume that I'm useless and, and totally inconsequential. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a big concern. That's a big, you have older children, correct? Yeah, I do. Um, And and I just want to comment on what you just said, because I believe it's part of our life cycle uh, from where we were. And and I can say when I first moved to Danville 43 years ago, I was young. I was single. Today, 43 plus years later, I'm a granddad with a family and with perspectives that are very different than maybe when I first moved into town. And I could say that it was all about me when I first moved into town. I could say that it was all about having fun when I first moved into town. And I had a fairly myoptic myoptic view on what I thought was important for me. But as you grow up over the years, as you learn more about what you are, who you are, and most importantly, what you want to achieve so that when you're reflecting back on your legacy, you feel good about yourself and what you've been able to accomplish, not just for yourself, but for all those around you. Uh, It really does change the way that you look at how best to approach going forward and who's more important. 
not just what's more important, but who's more important as well. Right. So I know we get into a little bit of rhetoric here, but I am totally committed and convinced that my life cycle has taught me a lot about me, about my family, and most importantly, about my community as well. And today, I am committed on helping my community because I believe that I've done quite a bit to learn and uh, help myself and my family. And it's just a different, again, stage in my life cycle as to who I think is most important as I continue to build on my legacy. Right. And having having that accumulated experience, that accumulated knowledge, it's I always joke with my students about it. It's like, look, you guys are sponges. You don't even know how many hours and resources go into you. You can't appreciate somebody committing their life to making sure you're okay at every moment. And I'm not saying you're bad people for being like this. This is, like you keep pointing out, this is a life cycle. And at this stage, you are just absorbing. You're absorbing all of the goodwill, all of the help, all of the labor that other people put in. But there will come a time when you need to start your own tap and you need to start giving out to people. Because if you don't, all of that effort that the people put in was for naught. It was all it was all useless. You can't be self-centered and and be proud of who you were at the end of your life if you were just self-centered your entire life. And there's always argument about like, well, you know, what if the thing I like doing is good for other people? Yes, that's fine. But the point is, at some point, you have to figure out a way to be part of the the system that raises up young people, that improves the world. You know, it's like the Boy Scout model, always Mm -hmm. leave the place cleaner than the way you found it. That's kind of it's kind of a difficult thing to see our way through right now, though, don't you think? Yeah, it is. And, and you know, it's, it's and where I am today, I'm very comfortable with myself. And what you shared and what I shared earlier regarding the life cycle, uh, at each stage, they're not mutually exclusive. It's a build. It's a leverage. It's how do you take advantage of what you've learned, what you've experienced, how you've dealt with people, how you dealt with situations, how you dealt with our environment. How did you learn from that and leverage what worked and continue to build so the next time you're faced with this similar situation, you know how to uh, address it. And most importantly, how to not just address, but also consider different scenarios for different solutions to resolve whatever that issue might be. But that just doesn't come from sitting in a vacuum. That's from years of experience of working with people. Because, again, I'm not in a silo where I can say I am the smartest person in this world. I know it all. I don't need help. I don't need support. I don't need information from others or uh, rely on resources. I do because, to me, that's what's helped build to where I am today is the people around me, the, uh, the experience I've had with different organizations around me that help build my character, my personality, and most importantly, how best I can contribute as me, as myself, to my community. Right. Well, you have been part of lar- really large um, pharmacy practices, right? I mean, you are, well, I think... Yeah. It, it's interesting because, yes and no. Um, I'm a pharmacist by profession. I graduated from UC Berkeley, go Bears. Go Bears. Uh, and then I graduated from UC Med Center in San Francisco with a, pharma- a doctorate of pharmacy degree. I did spend, and I have spent 43 plus years of my life working for very uh, large companies, Long's Drug Stores, which is a local company that uh, was acquired, and Safeway as a senior uh, executive uh, leading uh, a fairly large fiscal budget as well as numbers of people. But I've also been a small business owner. I had my own consulting business. And today, I'm actually a vice president of pharmacy for a startup technology company. So I've seen the spectrum of small, mid, and large companies. That must be an incredible, incredible asset when, when running for a town council, because you have, you have that exact kind of breakdown 
within a town, right? Like you have to deal with the massive contractors and, and companies. You have to deal with the state. You have to deal with all kinds of legislation. But you also have to come all the way down to the to the micro level, the individual, right? You might be dealing with one individual landlord or a business owner or just a just a private citizen who has has issues and you have to be able to deal with the the whole spectrum with a degree of sensitivity and and competence that allows allows for real solutions to take take action and you know you're you're absolutely right um however i've also learned from from working with uh mid and small size companies based on the experience and knowledge that i have that they consider me a resource to support them in coming up with a decision that makes sense for all of us as well. For example, with my startup, uh, the average age for my startup, 30 years old. I've got 300 (laughs) employees, the average age is about 30 years old. Oh man. Uh, So why was I brought on? Because a heavily invested company and the the charge was uh, we need to deliver success and do it as quickly as we can because it's all about return on investment. Sure. As a startup, and with the number of startup employees, uh, they may have knowledge, but they don't have experience. I was brought on to basically take them over the goal line. Get from A to Z, minimize your mistakes, leverage off your experience, and help build and mentor our folks so that over time, they become empowered to make good decisions without having to go through a lot of trial and error. Right. There's there's this big push, and you see it at all levels of, of different types of elections. And the idea that people need to bring in this, you know, fresh, young view and people need to really bring this energy and, you know, we need to turn things over. And I've, I've talked to some people and they're like, well, I want a younger person because, you know, time to time to mix things up. And I I always leave wondering in those questions, like, Wait, what are you saying to me? Like, this is not like cake batter. You want to mix things in. Like, what do you what? When you say mix things up, I think of, you know, this kind of tumultuous process. When I think of somebody I want at the helm, I want someone steady, seasoned, right? Somebody who understands when not to panic, you know, and when to think slowly and when to move quickly. Those are the types of things that breed competence and success in a wide variety of complex complex points. And it's it's just very telling that you would say, hey, look, I'm in charge of the people that would consider me a dinosaur. But I'm in charge because I know how to navigate these these odd waters. And and a lot of people, like you were saying, they may have knowledge, right? They, mm-hmm. You might be 30, you may have already been on two or three startups and you're very successful, right. but you just don't have the number of days on earth to have experienced the vast majority of things that you have. Yeah, and that's so true because we are still operating in a traditional world. Uh, there is a traditional infrastructure. There's traditional processes and controls that are in place. And to expect someone coming in to disrupt the status quo overnight uh, would be challenging. My, uh, my belief and my position, and I believe that's also very true of a lot of startups now who are hiring. And it's interesting because you're seeing some cycling where veterans are being re, uh, I'll call it, reintroduced it back into uh, the mainstream. It's because we are in a time-sensitive uh, period where comp- small companies need to be successful and need to be successful uh, earlier than later. Right. We are in a sense of urgency because of our current environment, our current situation, uh, and what and investors knowing that uh, with these distractions, there's still an end goal that says, I need my return on investment. Right. There's customers and uh, consumers out there that have expectations from companies and from different segments of business that we've, we've created expectations. Now they expect us to deliver on it. And we want to be able to meet, the, uh, meet those expectations because that's what we're all about. Uh, how do you get there? And so without getting too deep into detail, uh, I believe that the veterans will complement the fresh perspective, the younger perspective, because they, the, the fresh and young bring a perspective or views that may be very uh, out of the box. But in our world today, I think we need to think 
periodically and routinely out of the box. Challenge the status quo. But at the same time, how does the status quo challenge the new ideas as well? So at the end of the day, we have a solution that's mutually acceptable and in the, in the best interest of all of us. Right, right. And, 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 and it ends up with who is our customer? Who is, who is that consumer? Who are we trying to uh, you know, support and provide answers to? And, and I think we have to just make sure that we stay focused on who is that you know, who is our end goal customer, consumer uh, that, that we're trying to, to uh, please? Right. And a very interesting, uh, I mean, referencing back on it, it was like this massive experiment. The, speaking of startups, the dot-com crash in, you know, 98, 99, yep. 2000, you had this massive buildup and shift from seasoned standard business practices, business valuations, investor practices, and instead of going just somewhat to, to the left or to the right, just changing it a little bit, it was essentially like they gave the inmates they gave, gave the inmates yeah. the keys to the asylum. So all of a sudden you had a complete revamping of the, quote, new economy. This is the new economy. This is the new way to invest. Either, and you, anybody with a classic business sense would say these companies are losing un, unbelievable amounts of money with no real value or, or prospects down the road. And people said, no, 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 but their stock went up 50% last month, so we're going to invest because it's going up. And then eventually we all know what happened. But the difference between that and the revamping of the startups, like it was essentially the dot-com 2.0, where it was, okay, let's marry the seasoned expert veteran business structures and, and way of thought, and let's bring in Let's bring in all of the fresh ideas. Let's bring in all of the f uh, fresh blood and, and get creative and, and come up with things that people have never come up with. But let's, let's marry it to the seasoned approach, which we know will yield a long-term benefit, not a, not a short-term shot in the arm. Yep, that, and you said it well. Uh, what dot-com uh, demonstrated uh, and subprime. I mean, there were a lot of smoke and mirrors oh during those period of time, right? It's so pay – anytime somebody says subprime, I get like the hairs on the oh, back no, of my no, neck. No, it's like, no. oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> I experienced subprime. Uh, I experienced dot-com. And what I learned from both, and I believe that uh, not only business but society learned from both, was that businesses need to be accountable and responsible. Uh, and today – that is now, I would say, a given in any business that you have to be accountable and, and responsible and make sure that fiscally your numbers you can support. Uh, to me, that's, 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 that's just a core responsibility of any business today is don't smoke and mirror it. Right. Don't, don't stretch your numbers. You need to be accountable, responsible, and take whatever – uh, it, good comes with the bad, but you, you, uh, because we just too many people. There's too many dependencies. There's too many people. There's too many. Uh, there's the public that depends on your accountability and your responsibility. And we need, I need to own it and be accountable for it. Right. And I believe that's what dot com and subprime has taught us in business. Now, it's not a perfect world. And not maybe everyone subscribes to that, but I can comfortably say I absolutely do. And the companies I've worked for absolutely subscribe to that as well. Right. And it, it, if we were investors, say you and I each had $100 million to invest somewhere. If we were really serious about getting a return on that, we were really serious about putting it in the best place, we would likely, I would just assume, we would likely want to put it somewhere that shared those philosophical values, which is like, look, no matter what the situation is, good or bad, we have to be honest to the bone about it. Because if we're not, if we, if we sugarcoat it or we lie, one, it's a lie. And two, you prevent reasonable solutions from being created, right? The second, whenever I deal with my students, they don't get their homework done. I tell the parents right away. And the students get really upset at me sometimes. They're like, look, can you just, this is between you and me this time. I say, look, this is the problem. If we don't expose the issue, then you're a liar and I become a liar. 
And we can't address the problem anymore because your parents aren't brought on board and we don't have a, a united front. It stinks that it's this way, but we have to we have to bring it out into the open so we can address it and we can do better. And the whole near term mentality of okay, let's just sweep this under the rug and, and avoid this near term pain, especially when you're dealing with a large corporation or entity, it it it's prohibitive with finding workable solutions for months or years from now because those are the the little mistakes earlier on sometimes yield those big you know boat sinking tragedies. Yeah, you, you know, you're absolutely correct. And uh, one thing I also have learned is, as you take on that responsibility of being accountable and responsible, it also means that you're reaching out to those around you, your resources. Your, 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 the, the people you can count on, the representatives of the different entities that are uh, contributing to uh, your plan, and making sure that you not only solicit, but you uh, s- seek that input that's constructive to help build that plan. Because at the end of the day, it's a partnership. We're all in it together. I mean, it's today. You know, we talk about uh, you know, the, the, the platform, well, we've got the schools over here. We have the community over here. Right. We have business over there. At the end of the day, we're on it, we're on it together. This, right. this is a journey that we're all in. The, the second thing that I would comment on is when we are investing in accountability and responsibility. Yes, it's, uh, in business I learned it's quarter to quarter. Did I hit my numbers or did I not hit my numbers quarter to quarter? However, we are also investing for the longer term. So we need to have a strategic plan. And whether it's a five-year plan, three-year plan, I think today's world, we look at three-year plans because Mm -hmm. the world is moving so quickly. We need to make sure we have a plan and we have a roadmap for achieving that plan and that we have routine benchmarks to determine where we are in the plan and make the appropriate adjustments, but we stay on plan. Because not only does it help us focus on what our end goal is, but it's predictable. It allows the population, it allows all of us, uh, all of those that partner with us, our bosses, our community, whomever it is, to know what that plan is, where we are on that plan, and to stay on track with the plan as well. So the more predictable we are, the more comfortable people have that we are, uh, we know what the end goal is and that we are staying focused on achieving that goal. Right. Predictability seems to be the hallmark of, of really successful planning. A, a, a good friend of mine, mentor of mine, said, hey, look, I don't like high taxes, okay? That's, that's the way it goes. But just tell me what the taxes are going to be not in the next six months, not in the year. Just tell me this is the way it's going to be. Tell me what the tax rules are and let me plan accordingly so I can make the best, most informed business decisions. Because he said, look, the worst thing you can do is tell me that maybe you'll decrease taxes or maybe you'll... He was like, look, if you're telling me that in six months or if you get elected or in nine months, you're going to decrease the capital gains tax. Yeah, look, I like that. But all of a sudden, the plan I had in place for, say, selling a property or selling a stock or selling a business, doing whatever, if I can't say this is the best decision to do right now, because all of a sudden I'm thinking about, oh, in six months it might be a better, and all of a sudden the time frame just starts getting screwed up, then nobody can actually plan appropriately. And you're always second guessing yourself, which makes making informed decisions nearly impossible because you're shifting. Yeah, and, that, and that's where I subscribe to this discipline called key performance index or key performance, we call it KPIs. Sure. Uh, we need, we, one, we do, and, and I'll use the, the town as an example, we have a fiscal budget. Mm-hmm. That budget is what's planned for this coming year. And that budget also is contributing to the long-term strategic plan, which is a three-year plan. We also have line items to support that plan. We're going to track each of those line items and see how we're performing to plan. We also want to make sure we understand what are the dependencies or the, or, or, or the factors that contribute, that influence those line items as well, so that if we see variances from 
what's acceptable KPI, we have an opportunity to jump on it and find out what's going on. Not to say, you know, uh, for example, and I think this is a perfect example, uh, small business, uh, you're not able to contribute the sales tax that you normally do because of sure. what's going on with, with COVID-19. That's a line item. So we look at that and say, okay, overall, if we see that there is a variance from that line item and we want to continue to stay on track with our budget, meeting our balance, balanced budget, what are the areas that we can offset to make sure that we hit that budget and then put a, put a game plan together to achieve that? Right. Uh, but what we have to be cautious of is not to criticize the line item owner and say, you didn't hit your numbers, therefore shame on you, and you need to figure out how to make that happen. It's difficult when they only have so much control. And, and again, as I said earlier, we're in it together. Those other line items are, have other owners. And together, we can help that one line, that one owner who may not be able to achieve that particular number. But in return, we know in the longer term that owner when he or she or they are successful, will help support and contribute if one of their, uh, one of the other owners is not able to hit their numbers. So again, I, look, I tend to look at, and I know we're talking about just fiscal budgeting, but I look at our role of how we can be successful as a much more holistic approach than worrying too much about one segment being successful at the expe at the expense of the other one, or the the segment's not doing well, so therefore, let's put a focus here. There are many segments that contribute to the whole, and we will work together as a team to make sure that we all win at the end of the day. I think you're being far too reasonable. Uh, to be completely honest, you're no, far I, I, too I, reasonable. No, no, I don't think it's reasonable, that, I, and I know we're going to. That we're makes get into sense. philosophical differences. Yeah, but it makes perfect sense. Of like, of course, if you work together as a team. That's great. That's and and that's what it should be. Yeah, and I think that's the role of the town council. I, I think we we're the we're an enabler in the technology world. Uh, technology is called an enabler. Uh, we don't disrupt. We don't intervene. We don't obligate ourselves. We're an enabler. How do we enable success and build the right infrastructure to to, to enable others to succeed? So again, overall, uh, we win. Right. And, and, and at the same time, we do have to take on a leadership role uh, in addition to be an enabler because, you know, to enable, you've got to also be able to develop that plan and be able to get everyone on board uh, in order to, 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 to stay focused on delivering to that plan as well. So there is a leadership responsibility and accountability, accountability of, of, of the town council as we continue to build a stronger Danville. I appreciate so much that you, you have that perspective, which is, hey, look, we can't make businesses do anything. We can't make the economy in Danville spring up. We can't make private citizens do anything. What we can do is set up a structure that's conducive to drawing in business, that's conducive to drawing in consumers. We make it we make it like a, the, the petri dish with the best possible nutrients and then then just let it grow do the best you can and instead of having the standpoint people people talk a lot and have been recently about like well i'll fix this and i'll fix that it's like i don't i don't know that you're going to have that level of influence over an individual business owner the best you can do is work with them right so one of the great things that that I've been very complimentary of the city doing recently is is opening up the the portion of the street downtown on Friday, mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday, right. um, and then uh, uh, taking the little essentially courtyard over near bridges and whatnot. That is such a tremendous tremendous help. And again, like you're saying, I, I, we're not making the businesses do this. We're not making the consumers come. But we're, what we're doing is enabling them to grow and survive in this very difficult time. Maybe they're not thriving, but at the very least, they have a shot, right? Like they have a chance to make it happen. And it's going to be difficult. We're all going to have to fight like hell. But the town council needs to be enabling more ideas, more innovation, more um, again, more growth, like in the Petri dish. Right. Absolutely. And, and I really believe that that is the role of the town council, uh, is to enable success. And how you do it, and I know, 
you know, uh, someone will ask, well, be specific. Give me the one, two, three, four. Uh, there's no playbook for what we're going through right now. Uh, we have to be nimble. We have to be flexible. We have to try things. If it don't work, let's go try something else. But at the end of the day, let's solicit the input from not just business, but the community. Because, you know, this community is represented by a whole heck of a lot of successful people right. in business and in life. What have we done to really reach out to them and say, hey, can you help us here? What can you suggest? Because I know in the town council meetings, and uh, you know, we have representatives from business that uh, give us kind of a, uh, you know, an update as to what's working, what's not. Uh, and I know we have the commissioners representing the different uh, commissions that will provide input. Um, but it's time, I think, for our community to get more engaged in our success because they are part of our success. And I don't know if we've done enough of that. And now somebody said, well, we, we make it so difficult on how we communicate that our listener may not understand what we're asking them to do. Uh, and, and my answer to that is I totally agree. We need to kind of simplify what we're asking. And two, rather than waiting for them to come to us, how do we leverage our government, our commissioners, our town council, to be ambassadors going out into the community? I mean, there are HOAs all over the town of Danville. They have meetings once a quarter. There are groups that meet either monthly or quarterly. There are uh, activities to go on where there's opportunities to share what's going on in town. I think we need to spend time working with a small group of the community to figure out exactly how we can develop and build out and implement a communication strategy that solicits input from the community. A very smart community, a very intelligent community, and a very supportive community. Yes, I, I couldn't I couldn't be more in favor of that. I, th I think the difficulty that we're all experiencing at this point with, with some of the decisions the town has made, and, and you see the, the vitriol and lack of civility with, with some things like, like Prop Y, right? Or excuse me, Measure Y, yeah, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then the cell site towers. It's so clear that it's so difficult to get good information. But beyond that, the reason, or at least one of the reasons, that people are taking to, say, social media websites or, or, or really delving into this yeah. goofy kind of ways of communication is because we aren't, they're not feeling engaged by the town, right? And you, of course you could go to a town, uh, town meeting and stand in line and get your two minutes to scream and yell and everybody has to listen to you. But is that really the most effective way to have somebody feel heard? Because in those instances, it almost seems more of like a gotcha moment. Like somebody's going to get up and throw a zinger and everybody's either going to like cheer or boo. And, and it becomes almost this theatrical performance where you're not you're not given enough time as a citizen or say say somebody with a recommendation. You're not given enough time to really sit down and say, okay, hey, hang on, look, I know this because I'm a cell tech or I, I, I did these things for the military or something like that. Allowing people an avenue to, to connect with the town council and, and really, like you're saying, tap into the resources we have sitting right here. Sitting right, it's the citizenship of Danville. It's unbelievable. I couldn't yeah, agree amazing. with you more. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. No, and, and you know, um, the the Danville. I mean, we you know, there's always this, this comment made that what are we? You know, we must be doing something wrong. And you know, when you step back and realize where we were decades ago, where we are today, and the reputation we have for being one of the most desired communities to live and raise a family. And also retire. You may have heard that uh, recently there was a, a poll taken and we were ranked, uh, what was it, seventh uh, best place to retire in the state of California and number one in quality of life in California. That's beautiful. And, you know, uh, we don't need to look elsewhere. It's here. Right. And we've invested a lot of dollars, a lot of resources, a lot of support to build to where we are today. 
And my position and my platform has been, how do we harness the strengths and the assets of what's working right now and just build on it? You know, in leadership uh, in business, we learn, don't spend too much time with your weaknesses, work on your strengths, because it's easier to achieve success as you continue to leverage on what's, what are your strengths. Right. And I really believe in that. Dig in uh, deeper. Here's, here's a, a question, if we, if we may pivot, but leading off of that, mm -hmm. one of the areas that I think we're working really hard to address, but I think needs constant attention is more talking about uh, creating success or creating the, the platform for success, more accessible housing for older residents and younger residents, because it's all well and fine if you're retiring with 20 mil and you know you can buy a house on top of a hill somewhere and just call it a day. And that like good on you. That's wonderful. I bet the view is amazing. But for the rest of us that aren't that way, you know, and for for younger people, my wife and I moved here. We worked really hard through our 20s and we were very mm -hmm. fortunate to move here. Um, I think I was 29 and my wife was my wife's 28, but it was extremely difficult to, to come up with the money and then have the have the financial backing to move into into the little house we have and again I love my house but it's it's not the average person right since then I think there's only been one person in my whole neighborhood that's moving in that was that was in their 20s and they both worked like mad and then landed there at like 27 I think so those are resources you know those types of families they're resources in obviously from just a base consumer concept they they revitalize neighborhoods right and you're buying uh, you're buying older homes and and fixing them up they're going to very hopefully have kids soon and those kids are going to go into our school systems and and increase the the funding and the and the just the community there. I mean, there, there's a whole there's a whole chain reaction That's is right. what I'm saying by drawing in younger residents. What what more do you feel like Danville could do? Or what do you think we're doing okay, like is our strength, but we could do better? Yeah, I, uh, one, I believe that uh, we can continue to be uh, safe, safer than where we are today. Uh, we are considered, what, the safest town in the state of California? Yes. We have invested a lot to protect the safety of our cons of our children, of our families, of our veterans, of our seniors and others, working very closely with the uh, Danville police. And I believe the success of partnering, uh, the partnership between Danville police and the community, who has taken much more of an active role and much more of an engagement what role working with Danville Police is a model that needs to continue to uh, build on because I believe we only have 12 officers in the town of Danville and considering the population we have and what we've been able to succeed uh, to achieve and how safe we are that should tell us about uh, what's working uh, but as we move forward we're going to continue to be challenged with safety uh, whether it's social issues, whether it's changing demographics. I don't know if you're aware, but our, the demographics of our community is now changing. And are we adjusting to the change in demographics as we take a look at age, nationality, race? Uh, it, it's, 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 it's changing, and we just need to be able to, uh, we just need to ensure that we're updated on how best to protect the safety of those, of the, of those folks that live in the community and the businesses that thrive in this community as well. To me, that's, that's, that's foundational. Sure. Because I don't know why, you know, whether it was the attraction of open space or whether it was the, 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 the vitality of the, the, of the downtown that, that brought you here, but I got to believe safe had to be one of the core pillars of why you moved into this town and why you and your family are still here today. Right. Yes. Yeah, safety was way up there. I mean, we were, again, being an in, in-home tutor, I was going to people's houses all over the Bay Area. So you got a real sense of, okay, where, where, it, it, when we have the funds to buy a house, where would we really want to settle? And Danville overwhelmingly was it. I mean, you have this wonderful little downtown, you have great restaurants, you have 
great schools for the most part. I mean, there are, nothing's perfect, but you have you have a really good community. And the little neighborhood we lived in is is very much a mix of, of blue and white collar people, but just people, normal yeah. people that are that aren't super type A and crazy aggressive successful, but have a level of success and competence and feel for community that that I really appreciated. And you know, you're 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 you're, you're segueing uh, me into the next three areas because it's not safety is not mutually exclusive. If I were to have just move here for safety, uh, that probably would I be willing to afford or pay for just safety? And I would say, no, there's also three other uh, core strategies that, uh, that have achieved success for Danville. One is our Blue Ribbon Schools. Uh, another one is the fiscal accountability and responsibility to, ma- to, to, to manage and have a balanced budget, but to ensure that we have the essential services that are absolutely necessary for not only our residents to feel comfortable living in, but for those who visit uh, residents in the community or shop our businesses or uh, enjoy our restaurants as well and then the open space I mean you know you and I are dressed in shorts today and uh, we're probably going to head out and do what we need to do yes uh, because we enjoy the open space and our family enjoys just being out there yes uh, so so it's a four prong re- set of core strategies that to me uh, supports our success, but is more of a, it, it's going forward. It absolutely need to be our key strategies for investing towards success as well. Yeah, and and that the way you said it is is perfect because you can't have you can't have the schools without the safety. You can't have the safety without the schools. You can't have a, any of those things without a balanced town budget. You know, and Danville has done a tremendous job of being debt free and not having these ridiculous obligations that just keep getting kicked down the road by whoever happens to be in charge at the time. Um, So, again... And and, and, and let me finish up on that because you just said a really good point, which is that small town atmosphere and uh, the importance of maintaining that. Uh, You are absolutely correct that that we can't be mutually exclusive. But at the same time, there's a cost for all of that and you know we have to make decisions do we if we really believe in this if we subscribe to these four pillars and that's what makes us that um, persuades us as to why we live in Danville and why we want to continue to invest in Danville because it's not just us it's for our families and generations thereafter there's a cost to that and if there is a cost to that then we need to make sure that there's a benefit that's overwhelmingly greater than that cost. Right, something that justifies the expense. That's right. So, so for one to say, you know, we need to have this, we need to have that, uh, yeah, absolutely. But there's an investment in order to achieve each one of these needs. And it's not as simple as we can do it versus let's take a look fiscally at how we can not just afford it, but invest in it and make sure that we stay on track to build out that investment to get the proper return. And, you, you, you know, back to the question about affordable housing, uh, I believe that our town has done, uh, has a great playbook today on, affor- on addressing affordable housing. It's well known that uh, there is a state mandate and that the way the mandate was uh, applied was not very scientific, uh, and that we are required to have X number of affordable housing units uh, in Danville. The town has done an exceptional job with their playbook on how to be compliant, because not to be compliant has consequences that impact on funding for the community, as well as possibly other legal uh, or punitive actions as well. The town has a playbook today that is working. And I would absolutely subscribe and compliment the planning commission as well as the town council for developing and implementing that playbook because we have a large number of affordable units already in the community. 
But in general, visually, we don't know where they are because the town has done a great job of being in compliance, yet not disrupting the visual appeal of the small town that we have today. Right, and the dynamic, just the population dynamic. There's not, there, there are apartments all over the place or, or more affordable housing options all over the place if you know where to look. But it's not, the, the fear that everybody comes into with like, oh, it's going to create blight, it's going to change the atmosphere, it's all, it's like, it's not, you're not thinking about it correctly, right? All we're saying is slightly more affordable, and slightly more affordable is still in the thousands of dollars for like a one or two bedroom. So in your, you're just not going to experience the the things that you're anxious about. Yeah, and, and, and you just made another great point, and I'm glad you're sharing all these great points for me because you're segueing me into discussions. I I'm mean, here for you, sir. Yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, what the town uh, was able to uh, pass and adopt with ADUs is a perfect example. You know, for each ADU, there's another check on meeting the uh, the state requirement. The other unaffordable housing, and it's a little more longer term, and we got to think this out because it's, uh, I haven't thought it out totally, is we need, uh, as business grows in this town, we need good workers. Where do we find these good workers? And do we want to ship them in from other towns, or do we want to include them as part of our community? So, yes, maybe they're not the owners, but they support the owners. They support the business. How do we integrate them into our town so that not only are they supportive as employees, but they're also part of the community and part of the success? Right. And I think that's a great investment for the business. I think it's a great investment for our community. And most importantly, it's a good investment for workers who really want to enjoy and appreciate and really... uh, experience the reasons why we moved to Danville and own property. Maybe they can't own property day one, but they can at least get some of the benefits of why living in Danville, it makes such a big difference and why it's such a a desired community for for many families and and other folks. You know what's so interesting about the the affordable housing argument? Um, And again, I I get where you're saying, and I couldn't agree more. We need to have not just owners, but actual people from our community reinvesting in the community in employment and then reinvesting, you know, earnings into the into the shops here yeah. and, and the whole cycle, right? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. I think yeah. that's easy to understand. But the thing that gets me is, look, I'm not a loan broker. I'm not, uh, you know, recommending anybody come to me for advice, but it's very clear that it's far more affordable to live here than a lot of people worry about. Now, the state has its own mandates, and they have their own formulas, and, and good for them, it's it's fine. But there are, there are, for instance, condos and townhouses that can go for, say, five or $600,000. Now, you're not, you're not getting, you know, the four-bedroom, two-bath with a big yak backyard, but you can start your path of, of ownership, which obviously, you know, you create the daisy chain, you step up and you step up and you step up. And there are programs out there, if you're spending $2,000 in rent somewhere, you could easily, for the same after-tax dollars, own a property. Now, that, that might be a condo or a townhouse, but you can own a two-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath townhouse in downtown Danville. It's not going to be that much more. It might be around three hundred, or excuse me, three thousand dollars a month in a mortgage. But it's going to be below the threshold for um, for being able to deduct it, for, uh, deduct your interest and whatnot from your taxes. My point is, mm-hmm. without getting into the weeds, there are ways that people can own property here and start the path of ownership and step up from a two-bedroom townhouse to a three-bedroom house and then maybe a four-bedroom house later on as their family or their needs expand. Do you think there would be value in having a, a group that helped people identify you know, more affordable options, help people identify different kind of loan programs because there are, you know, there's the 20% down classic program or there's also a 10% down and then there's also an FHA 3% down. So you could right. theoretically buy a $600,000 townhouse with an $18,000 down payment. And I talked to my students about this. You know, they're from this area. They live in yeah. Danville and Alamo and Santa Mona. I say, you know, you guys really, you could move back here very quickly if you wanted to. And they all say, that's not true. My house is worth X number of dollars. And I say, you don't, okay, you're not going to buy your parents' house, but you can buy something here 
that's a two bedroom. You either live at large with an office in your, you know, your room sure. or you rent it out, rent out one of the rooms to your to your friends, and then you step up. And I always I take usually take three or four minutes. We talk about compounding interest and, and things like that in math anyway. Yeah. So I take three or four minutes and I explain the steps that they would need to take and what it would mean in ten or fifteen years. Overwhelmingly every single one of them says that makes total sense and I actually think I could pull that off. Because you, the, the starting base capital that you really need is not that profound. Right. It's not something where you have to wait till you're 30 or 40. And I think if more people understood that, we could draw more people into Danville or draw them from their parents' house because they move back home after, say, college, get them out of the parents will be happy, kids will be happy, they'll be part of the community, and they'll start their family again here. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And uh I believe it goes both ways. We have a, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, over 16% of our population now are over 65 years of age. I didn't know it was that high. Over, um, uh, over the age of 45 is approximately 50% of our population. We've got, an, we've got a, I'll call it an aging population. Right. Uh, how do we, and, and the, st- the strategy I would approach, and I believe some communities, many communities are subscribing to, is how do we become much more age-friendly? Well, part of being age-friendly is uh, some of these folks are sitting on a lot of equity, right. and, they can't, and they can't wait to get out of their huge home because there's no one living there anymore. Right. Uh, what is our program to facilitate or provide those resources that bridge them into say a smaller piece of property smaller footprint so that now we have a bigger home that could accommodate a family or a growing family that may be another option for uh, someone looking at living in danville right so i believe that uh that there's there's segments of our population that are going through the same exercise right now which is how do i either get into a home or get out of a home to a, a different size home right, or a different type of home. And I absolutely agree uh, that it would be great if we had a resource that's a little more personalized to the down of Dan- a town of Danville right? that understands Danville, understands uh, who's looking for what, and bridges how we can help them either getting into a home and or how to get out of a home, so to right. speak. Right, right. Uh, so I think I, I, that is a, a very good point, and I believe that one other note, and I'm not going to uh, ignore it, is that if we truly are investing in our workers, and because some of the best employees and the best, I call it, uh, point of view, first impression of a business is the employee that walks in, I mean, as you walk in the door and they say, how are you, can I help you? Right. How do we invest in them so that they become part of that population that's also looking for housing in the longer term so that they can be not just, um, you know, part of the community as a worker, but part of a community as an owner as well? Right. So I think there's opportunities to really uh, identify a number of different candidates or people that would be available. But I, I think... T- to your point and to my point, how do we personalize that bridge so that we can help uh, folks uh, achieve that goal of owning property here? Right, right. And and like you've talked about, the ADUs, I think, are, are just a tremendous, tremendous resource for, for property owners if they if they have the time and energy to, to look into them. It would be it would be amazing, and again, this is totally pie in the sky stuff, but it would be amazing yeah. if you took some of the anxiety with, okay, if I build this, would I be able to find a quality renter? Because the little ADUs, you could build a three, 400 square foot one. That's not gonna take two years to do. But if you had a means of helping people, helping, say, property owners, identify and, in a sense, partner with a renter ahead of time. Right. So they say, hey, look, this is the, where the place is gonna go, this is what it's gonna look like, would you be willing to sign a contract for in six months you're moving in barring any construction and mishaps and say absolutely i'd move in here and they get to meet each other so then the property owner goes into the construction knowing they have a secured source of rental income 
to offset the the capital expense of actually right. building it. And that way you can you can get ahead of the game. Instead of people saying, well, I don't know if I could do this, they already say, well, I have an identified renter. We're, yeah. we're good to go. It's going to be fine. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that as we approach, whether it's ADUs or anything else, that we have to have constant communication. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to keep uh, whatever the issue is top of mind and communicate. And, and when I say communicate, uh, bi-directional and in-depth. I believe that there's a lot of good recommendations, a lot of good practices that can build out that playbook so that whether I'm a homeowner with an ADU or one considering an ADU or I'm a bridge resource that could help someone get into an ADU, it's not like we're individually trying to figure it out. We have a playbook now that represents the best practices and the best recommendations, the best insight that will help navigate this individual or homeowner or whomever it is on better understanding how best to approach uh, ADU and, and its use. Yeah, right. There was a there was a property on uh, Buckeye that mm-hmm. that my wife and I looked at uh, a couple years back, and it's actually just just up for sale now. But they they redid it and everything. But our whole idea was it was a really expensive well expensive for us property. Yeah. But it was on it had a, a very large lot and about two thirds of an acre was buildable. It's you, next to this big drainage canal. But the point is our whole plan was move in and we'd fix up the main house. I'm very handy and you know I have no problem yeah. painting and blowing yeah. out walls. But build in the purchase idea was okay. We'd purchase it and then build an ADU to offset the cost of the mortgage and that would theoretically make the mortgage for this larger property and everything uh, pretty much analogous to what we had in the first place and having that kind of plan ahead of time which is hey look I know this is expensive but you can offset that cost and have an asset down the road if you think ahead just just this way I had a student uh, excuse me a student uh, years ago tutoring client the, the family had split up uh, unfortunately and the mom moved into an ADU in Danville and it was not a huge huge place maybe 400 square feet but it had a one bedroom and the the son would would come in um, I think it was like week on week off essentially but it was more than enough for her it was more than enough for him and mm-hmm. it, it, she was a great piece of the community she very much enjoyed it here and she found her next life partner here and and it was just wonderful to see it's like oh you're not like cast away yeah, right and, yeah, and she yeah. it's not like she didn't have uh, finances at the time but she just she didn't want to go out and just buy some three-bedroom house where it was going to be her the majority exactly. of the time she yeah. wanted that segue that kind of middle step right. to the next phase of her yeah. life ha- having those options to me are important the more options you have the more choices you can pick from that is personalized to fit your particular needs one other comment I'll make on ADUs is uh, what I worry about with with any new initiative which is unintended consequences uh what so you put up an adu okay what does that do to the traffic uh what does that do to um you know the the uh, the, the community itself uh, and i'm a firm believer that part of that playbook should be let's make sure there's a box that says make you know that that we consider uh, traffic. We right. consider uh, stress on utilities. Yeah, things exactly. Of that yeah, there's variables there that, you know, maybe they've been talked about. Maybe they've been discussed. Maybe it, it's already considered. Uh, but I believe that's part of the playbook. The other is uh, your neighbors. I'm a firm believer. We live in a community. The community is not me. The community is everyone around me because at the end of the day, we support each other in a lot of different ways. Let's make sure we're having conversations with our with our neighbors, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, we we want to all support each other when it comes to the build out of that ADU and what the uh, I won't call it implications, but what some of the 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 effects of that right. impact it might have. So uh, again, if we have a, a playbook, I believe I believe in in, in the human being that 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 is going to do the right thing, right? Well, if I may ask, yeah. we've, we're, which I love, we're diving really deeply into the, into the the affordable housing. But what are the other low hanging fruits? What are the other primary things you look at and say, "Gosh, you know, we've done a pretty good job, obviously, because Danville's great." But there are different ways of thinking about this, or different ways of addressing that you you feel like you could obviously bring your ex- extensive expertise to. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, one is um, really our business community. Uh, and I know everyone is talking about how do we revitalize the business community uh, because it does represent 16 to 18 percent of our contribution to the general re revenue right. or the general fund. And there are so many residents that have businesses downtown. I mean, that, it's like this is where we work. This is where we play. This is where we live. Like, this is it. And, 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 you, and that's a very good point. And, and when I say business, it's not just downtown. Right. We have a number of centers that support our community that need to be not just acknowledged but recognized as we look at how best to build out and support their revitalization as well. Uh, so one, I, I really believe, as I mentioned earlier, that we need to seek input from those business owners, and I believe we do that. But I don't want to spend a lot of time just seeking input because we're in a sense of urgency period right now. Right. And as we emerge from COVID-19, rhetoric is good, but action is better. Right. And we need to be able to uh, adjust to that growth, but we have to be smart and we have to balance it between growing our business and the safety of our community. What I most worry about is we're out there opening up the businesses and now we have positive cases of COVID. Right. Guess what? We're going to close the business. Oh, my gosh. Right. Everybody's okay. saying we got to open because it's best for business. It's not going to be best for business if we all get locked inside again. That's exactly right. And there is enough. Uh, I won't even call them testimonials more. There's enough data points right now of what's happening across the U.S. that's telling us don't do that. Right. Be smart. Be intelligent. How do you, how do you manage that growth in a way that respects and insist that our the health of our community is not being compromised here. So that's the first thing is uh, seeking input from the business community, but also seeking input from best practices of what other communities have done that works. And, it's, and I don't say just Tri-Valley. I, I really do mean just other communities across the U.S. that have been exposed to this. I would also say, uh, you know, source off of government, uh, uh, source off of public health services, source off of, and, and that's a role of, of the town council is to, you know, capture this information that represents best practices. Because we're not the first to have experienced COVID-19. Right. <laughs> and we're not going to be the last. Right. And a number of communities have done a lot of great things. What can we do? To solicit input from the, uh, from those best practices outside of our community as well as the ones within. Two, providing the resources that enables them to be successful. We can't be prescriptive and tell them do this because we know for you you will be successful because each business is unique and it needs and, and whatever plan they put together needs to be personalized to achieve their particular success. But we need to understand each individual business, what their challenges are today, and what resources we can support them in order to achieve success going forward. But again, mindful of the fact that not at the expense of uh, consumers being reinfected with the virus, and now we're shut down again. Right. What are some of the greater things that you think that, that you've seen other, other municipalities or other towns do, and what are, what are some of the things that you would shy away from? Yeah, and, and this is where I, 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 I reference my business. Uh, you know, I, I oversaw uh, 3,000 pharmacies in the United States and Canada. They that's weren't all of, perfect. They that's weren't a all lot perfect. of Tylenol, man. Yeah. <laughs> and they weren't all perfect businesses. You had some that struggled. You had some that were successful. So what do you do? First, understand who your consumer is and understand the market landscape. Two, understand the data analytics. Now, there's a lot of data there that tells you or, or provides insight on who your customer is and what are those, those opportunities to meet their needs, whether it's in merchandise whether it's the way you communicate with them and market to them, whether it's uh, you know your location, there's a number of data points that may be helpful in order to give that business a little more insight as to how they can 
prepare for success or, or approach position for success. Uh, I think that's an opportunity where uh, we have a number of small business owners that don't have that resource of being able to get to the data and to analyze that data in order to provide good feedback. And then working with them to develop out what that uh, plan is and then how to operationalize that as well. Now, again, we're not going to lead them to the end result, but we will give them the resources and the opportunity to learn how best to, to, to build out their own plan and to navigate that plan as well. Right. You can lead a horse to water. You can, you're not going to force the business to do it. You can just say, hey, look, this is what we have kind of got together as far as information. And this these appear to be the top two or three kind of actions to to address these problems that you have. Yeah. And the other thing I would do, and this is um, as a result of my role as uh, a commissioner on the Senior Advisory Commission, uh, right now, we have, a, as I mentioned, we have 16% of our population is over 65. We also know that approximately, you know, only, only 20% of that senior population take advantage of our programs or get out. Uh, I think as we all get older and uh, what we're finding is this, the, the large percentage of the senior population stay home. Right. Um, they're very smart people. They've been through life. They've been through experiences. How do we encourage them to be more, uh, what's the term, transgenerational? Transgenerational. That's a good one. <laughs> Where they're integrated with our community but they become uh, a resource to support some of the businesses because they've been there and done that. And there's probably a lot of foundational things that make good sense that might help uh, a business owner develop and build out their business as well. So it's, again, as I mentioned earlier, how do we leverage the community and now a segment of that community who's looking to be more involved with the community I mean, they're still living here. They want to live here, and they want to figure out ways to be more productive in this community. How do we engage them to support our businesses as well? So that's another example of uh, let's not just spend money to spend money, but how do we leverage and build off of what we have today and the community we have today and the, the strengths of what they provide in order to better, I call it, the greater good. Right. Well, the, the, the beauty of Danville, if, if anybody pays attention to it, is that the emphasis is always being incredibly smart with every dollar you part with. Right. I mean, uh, as you were talking about, we only have what, like a dozen police officers in Danville, mm -hmm. but we're incredibly safe because of the structure that Danville has put into place. And therefore, we don't have to have 30 police officers or 50 police officers. We can have a very lean, effective, capable police department and a very, very safe town. And Again, it, it sounds it sounds that uh, the emphasis, at least in part, is look. Let's tap into the resources that we have right here. Again, and that makes perfect sense. If you have a retired, say, senior who's say seventy and has had a very successful business um, and and career, why not engage them on a more meaningful level with younger business owners? I mean, for, for in in my life, I have done that. I've mm -hmm. I have mentors that I have myself, but. Um, you know, finding those people and helping connect them really could help add this deep well of experience and, and knowledge that obviously younger business owners don't have on a regular basis. Yeah, and, and I think that it's also, and again, uh, I think a, a benefit that may not be, uh, it's more qualitative than, than quantitative, is uh, with the segment of the population as they become more integrated into the community no different than a worker that's integrated into our community they become uh customers of our community and that helps grow business that's wonderful so uh, you know i i am a firm supporter of the fact that the danville government and the town council has been very smart and very disciplined on investing in the long term and that's why we are where we are today and i'm a firm believer that again we need to leverage off of what has been working 
but really take advantage of now the community helping us as we continue to help them. And as I mentioned earlier, we're all in it together. It's not government at the expense of the other, or it's not gov or business doing it in a silo, separate from the community. We're all in it together. So how do we, you know, it's a little altruist, altruistic on my part, but I'm also very practical by saying that we want to work with each other. We just need to ask, and we need to seek out. And I'm confident we will have the support necessary to take us over this next this hurdle that we're dealing with today called post-COVID. Right, post-COVID. Yeah. Gosh, I can't wait to get into that phase. Yeah. yeah. 2020 will is here. 2020 will be behind us. Right. And 2021 will be a uh, an opportunity for us to continue to succeed. Yes. Well, I know. I know we don't have too much more time because I know you have to do get get back to work. One more question I have for you is how how do we continue improving upon the the education in this town, right? Like we have elementary, we have middle, we have high schools. And do you feel like younger people are a resource we can we can start asking more from? Because I I definitely feel like the the younger community, let's let's just look at high schoolers. They they're always looking for things to do right like you were saying we just need to ask and the the world is filled with excuse me not the world but the the community is filled with younger people who are going elsewhere to contribute like they'll go to the monument crisis center or they'll go to you know assisted living um, homes in in rossmore wherever it may be but how do we tap into that resource on a more local level because as I don't know if you follow up on on the college politics and whatnot, but yeah. as we as we phase out, um, or excuse me, as the UCs and the CSUs phase out the use of standardized tests, we as a community are going to have to find ways to improve younger people's applications and chances of gaining admission to four year college if that's what they want to do. We need to help them improve their applications in non quantitative ways. Right, because the GPA is going to be whatever the GPA is. And if schools aren't looking at test scores, then it really just leaves, okay, right. who are you outside of this GPA? So is there a way that you feel like we could tap into them and get this uh, relationship based on reciprocity? They get experiences and benefit and, and knowledge and something on the resume, and we get this great boom of, of tapping into this younger energy pool. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, in... in you, uh, I'll just comment based on something I just wrote to um, one of our community uh, residents who even asked, asked me a similar question to that. And my, my first comment would be that we do have Blue, Rib- Rib- Blue Ribbon education, and that's why uh, we attract so many folks to, to our community. But probably most important in, is that we also socially develop these folks so that they can be uh, successful adults. Uh, and we've demonstrated that uh, just with the feedback and what you know where children are today as they grow up. I don't think we need to brag about it. Uh, I think it's evident what we've been able to achieve. As we take a look at public service, I'm inspired by the engagement of uh, younger candidates, and it's not only here in Danville town, but uh, in other towns as well, who are now, and I think whether we call it as a result of post uh, of uh, COVID-19 or not, uh, there is much more of a focus and emphasis on public service by the younger community. And I absolutely would as town council, as a town council member, uh, want to engage that population so that they understand that part of s- social development includes the public service. I believe that we've had good representation over the years, but we can do better. And I believe that part of what 
the council can do, and I and this is something I do I do want to read because it's something I shared with uh, this resident, is that I see the town council's role as the community's representative and enabler with the schools and advocate continued engagement and transparent communication between school administration leadership, students, and instructors so that we can not only plan together, but how best to support each other as we continue to grow, both as a town and as an uh, as a as a as a as a school system. Uh, I think we need to, you know, the schools are going through a lot of challenges right now. Yeah, no kidding. And the focus is really on you know the child education, and then how do we get them, how do we op- reopen schools as quickly as we can. Uh, there is that balance, as I mentioned earlier, between opening schools and protecting the health of our community. So we got to be smart as to how we go about it. But we need to have a plan. And what's great about a plan is we all get together, we all agree, we have a plan. We'll try things. We'll have some things will work, some things will not. But we're all in it together. And what's great about the students is they're part of the plan. They're part of the engagement. They're part of the journey. They get involved and are engaged in understanding what we are doing, how we're going about it. The great thing about that is that they're no longer students. Now they're part of the community. We'll yes. call them the student community. Yes. And to me, that's, that's something that is foundational, that as they are more engaged and as they understand how they contri- contribute, that over time that's going to build to a perspective that says, you know, it's more about me I can make a difference to my community, and therefore I must find ways to participate. I don't think we can change behavior by telling a student, get engaged. I believe that we change behavior by including them in our journey towards uh, ensuring that we continue to be a blue ribbon school system. And you enable them. And you you enable them, absolutely. Listen, I'm not going to force you to do this. I'm going to make the Petri dish just right, so you're going to die to be part of it. But but, at the same time, they see the success of what they were able to uh, contribute. Maybe uh, in a small way, because the the administrators took much more of of a dominant role, or maybe the town took more of a dominant role, but they see their role and the end result of what they were able to contribute to that success and continue to want to be engaged. And over time, it'll be part of their, I call it behavior, of wanting to to approach more public service because they've seen the success of what they can deliver based on their contribution. Right. Start start a a pattern of successful endeavors. And I would do that with constant communication and keeping it top of mind you know too often human nature is we start something we end something let's go on to the next thing (laughs) okay we if we really believe and subscribe to the importance of our future and our future of danville is our students our children then we got to keep this top of mind keep it top of communication and at all levels encourage and support continued communication and involvement by our children in public service. Dave, I gotta let you go, but one more question. Why are you doing this? (laughs) You have, you obviously have this lifetime of just incredibly successful education and career. You have your family, you have, you have so much else that you could pay attention to. Why, why come back to Danville? Why, why make this your focus? I started the conversation by saying that I moved here for a reason. Uh, and those reasons were quite clear. And I think it's been shared by other candidates as well. Safe community, blue ribbon schools, open space, and fiscal re- responsible environment that allows me to enjoy the small town atmosphere and still grow with the community as well uh, to this day. We are still, it's still the reason why I'm still here. It's working. The investment is there. It's, uh, we've committed to it and we and the community and the town council has been able to deliver on it. Uh, I'm at a point in my 
life where it's time for me to contribute back to the community in a way that hopefully will be uh, supportive of what we have been able to achieve up to this point. Now, someone would say, well, that's a lot of rhetoric. Can you be more specific as to why you're doing it? Is I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear. I haven't asked you that once, <laughs> but like, it's fine. <laughs> much as understanding the framework of what I'm trying to achieve and then leaving it up to me to figure out how to make that happen later on. But I don't do that in a vacuum. I do it with help from a lot of resources, a lot of smart people who uh, can help me develop uh, that right, uh, you know, that right change. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is I have the energy, I have the passion, I have the experience, and it's time for me to devote my focus towards giving back to a community that really has helped grow not only my family, but helped me grow uh, myself into where I am today. Beautifully said. Absolutely beautifully said. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Good luck with this. Hey, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, vote for Fong. And obviously, we have uh, our website. What's your website? Yeah, it's www. Council, yeah, and everybody should have received their ballots. And everyone should have received their ballots. Uh, it, start, it started yesterday, and over the course of the next few days, should receive it. So please, uh, please make sure you're, you're, you're voting and you vote for Fong. Wonderful. Well, again, good luck. Thanks, everybody. Hey guys, just a quick apology. The mistake at the end there with the audio was on the technical side. My apologies for not catching it. Dave was great to have. Thank you for listening. <laughs>